been bereaved um, if they don't recover in the way that other people feel they should recover, which is a whole other topic, recovery. Um, and what I've come to see relating my own history and relating the histories of uh, the stories of people who, who that come to me for counseling, bring me their stories, is that trauma really is a tearing of the fabric and that it's the reweaving that needs to happen. Um, but because so much of trauma and recovery is construed as an individual thing, people feel alone with this, this tearing of the fabric and, and they don't quite know how to get to a place where they are reconnected. You know what's interesting about that? Um, my sister is, my sister is very ill, and so we, you know, as a family, going through that. I know, I'm sure many, probably everyone here, has experienced that process. What's interesting is is the evolution of these groups online, um, Caring Bridge, and lots of helping hands. And what's, you know, I've just, it's such an amazing process that. You know, it's such a hard thing to be dealing with somebody who is in the process of dealing with a terminal illness. And, you know, I'm really amazed at, at, at this evolution of this kind of helping network of people. That, you know, it's very concrete, very specific, but it's also very emotionally um, supportive. Because I, I think that, you know, it's so often, it's such an isolated process for people. Can I go back to Alive? Because you're really taking me there because the Alive model came out of me waking up three years ago in a hospital bed, not knowing why I was there. I still have no memory of the car accident. But I knew profoundly I was meant to still be alive. I didn't know whether I was going to stay alive, and my partner Joan didn't have any idea. So here's the relational stuff. Uh, the Alive model, I knew what Christian required was a big piece of who I am and what I do, so I knew I wanted something around that. But the Ellen Alive, is the love, and it's a significant part of the model that allows you to go through traumatic times not knowing what you know. Right, so you can appreciate the inquire in between is the love, in order to venture, for me it's learning to walk again, uh, and evolve continuously because you have no idea who you're going to be based on what you've been through. But that supportive, caring love is the absolutely critical piece. It's a relational piece. Because it wasn't just my journey. I mean, Joan's at home wondering where I'm, I am because I'm not back for dinner. And then suddenly she feels, because ah, she's a kind of psychic. So she calls all the hospitals from where I was spoke, where I had been facilitating, which was a ways away. And she kept calling them until she got the Halifax infirmary. And you said, who are you? Oh, I'm Jean's partner. Hold on a minute came back on, they said, we'll have a social worker ready for you and to please get somebody to drive you here. We can't tell you what happened, but she's just arrived. So can you imagine the trauma? I mean, I think that's harder, actually. I have no memories of what I'm yes. doing, waking up going, yeah, I'm undelighted, and life is so good, because I'm alive, right? <laughs> so I mean, that whole connection and caring and it's such a fundamental piece. And, and I think that, you know, complementing what you're saying, in, at least in my experience with dealing with trauma, is two important things when we are doing that kind of work. One is language, the way in which we use language with the trauma survivor. And the other one is the powerful relationship between you and the person. Not only for the person, but for you also, because it's secondary trauma for us yeah. all the time. Right. You know, it's not only for them, it's secondary trauma for me, it's secondary trauma for my assistant, it's secondary trauma for whoever is around it. Um, and I'll give you an example, like um, last year we were at the conference for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and we were talking about a case um, that we were dealing with. This father um, was inside the house when his two children went out to play and never came back home. And then he started calling the police to see where they were and what was going on, and, and he started freaking out, it was getting late, and they wouldn't return home. And they never did. So the first thing that 
we realized was like how the police enforcement went to his house to get information and to start searching for these boys. And the way in which they were talking to the father were more traumatic mm -hmm. than what was going on, using like past tense. So what were they using and what would happen if they don't come back and do you have arrangements for this? Like, like they were dead. And they were not dead. We could not use that language yet because we didn't know what was going on. So it was more traumatic. So we have to be very careful when we use the language, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the relationship, the powerful relationship, at least in my practice, like the relationship between the therapist and the person struggling. I, 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 I could resonate with that. Um, I, I've always thought that in, um, in my, in my history, I was also a marriage and family therapist for many years. And one story comes to mind where a little boy, and I was doing supervision, had come in, and a group of therapists had determined that he was sexually abused. Because of a four-year-old boy, because of various things that he said, that was their truth, that they were working around. And his reality, though, was that he wanted to be in therapy, not to talk about what the therapists were calling trauma for him, because he didn't see it as trauma. That mm -hmm. wasn't his experience. Yes. He wanted to be there, he wanted to play. And the therapists, much like you said about the police, the therapists asking him about their version of his reality and putting the trauma word on him was more traumatic mm -hmm. to him. So I, I get what you're saying. I think with law enforcement, it's the worst. Like, yeah. That's <laughs> what needs the most work. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to pick up on what's been said recently with uh, what's been said in the beginning about the deconstruction yes. as part of the, the yes. healing and transformation. Usually when we think about trauma or, or brokenness, we think about it in a binary relationship between uh, wholeness. What does wholeness mean? Trauma is the absence of wholeness. Wholeness is the absence of trauma. And so we, we have that in, in that oppositional relationship. Uh, I heard of a story where a family was dealing with their the father of the family dying of cancer. And he, literally he was on his deathbed. And this family was particularly quite devout. They called their minister over and you know, they were praying for the father to be cured of the cancer. They believed that if they prayed hard enough and believed hard enough that that would be cured. And so they, they prayed, they prayed fervently. About two weeks later, he passed away. Uh, a couple of months later, the minister kind of got back to the family and they talked about that and he asked them, they talked about it and the family said, our father wasn't cured but he was healed. And that definition, that understanding, not only applied to him, but the family. And so what they meant was, those two weeks, there was a time of family praying together, talking about family stories, sharing their relationship, and it was such a, a richness that the family hadn't known in the past. I guess they weren't that type. And they said it was so, it was such a, a special time that when he died, he was at peace. And so he wasn't cured, but they felt their prayer was answered, that there was healing and wholeness in that sense. And it wasn't the wholeness in terms of the trauma was fixed, everything is now disappeared, but almost like there was space created to, to carry that pain forward that loss and that becomes integrated part of their family and part of their life experience as they as they move on. So that deconstruction of that thing I, I found very, very significant. Can you repeat that one sentence? You said there was space created for you said the trauma wasn't fixed, but rather there was space that was created to healing. To help carry that pain? Carry that. Yeah, you, and you, you talked about a carry, being able to hold the hold it, um, and so there was healing in that the sense of 
well, the word in English healing comes from the word healing comes from wholeness. There's an Anglo-Saxon word that means wholeness, from healing. And, and uh, yes. we, we make space yes. for that yes. rather than fixing it's, it to exactly. become, you exactly. know, broken toaster. Now it's fixed again. Exactly. All, all the repairs are done. It's, but we create that space. So I'm, I'm, I'm really curious too because uh, how you described it, and I think there's been. Um, what everybody else has said is, is looking at it beyond the reductionistic tendency of the, the trauma, the individualized, you know, deconstruct it to begin to understand where, you know, um, what's underneath, what the meaning people are holding around this. And I'm curious that, for me, it's like we're all still talking about individual stories and individual experiences. I'm curious about how do we translate this in terms of communities? You know, whether it's, however we define community. It could be a community at work who's in conflict and there's trauma there. It could be communities that a number of you are working with. It could be, you know, moving that to a country like Colombia or South Africa. So how do we begin to look at, I'm curious, how do we begin to look at that so there's not a separation, but there's holding both that individual experience Experience as we are building these or um, paying attention to the relational practices while we extend this. But to do, you, communities. do you think it's possible to separate them and look only at the individuality of the trauma? Because I can't. No, it's not that I'm just curious because that's oh, the story okay. people's the okay, stories yes, are saying. Yes, yes. So I'm just curious about, yes. about that. Because I, I think trauma is like a ink that you have in your hand. Yes. And, and everything you touch. You, you contaminate it in a way. Well, and you know, so and and so I guess I'm wondering. Maybe let me ask the question differently. What's where does the um, Camille talked a little bit about this? She started. Mm -hmm. What's the where's the community in all this? Yeah, so yeah. is everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Family gets the family. Yeah, good. 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 So good. Yeah, yeah. I see these two because all, all yeah, they're all relational good. and they're yeah. all about community. Yeah, and yeah I feels, think so. Yeah, I think there is a sense of community. Yes. Every yes. time something happens. Yeah. And you see it in the news or you hear it. Mm -hmm. The thing is that I think that human beings have a tendency, and I don't want to generalize it, but it's like, okay, well, it's horrible, I suffer, but it will never happen to me. Yeah. It yeah. happened to somebody else, but it will never happen to me. Almost in a way of protecting themselves. Yeah. They suffer, they have empathy, but in a way it's almost like, oh, oh, it was my neighbor. It was a boy across the street. It was somebody else. You, you, so how do we make this a little more explicit that this is a community that, that there there is this community, larger community? Yes, yes please. So in all of these stories, there were elements that you wanted to carry to a, a greater scale, right? So the relationship of the pastor with the family and with the alive program, the programs that people have been talking about. How do we like identify what's rich and wonderful about that and see if we can Scale that. So, an example I'll give you is that we're, both Arielle and I are working at the like kind of a statewide level around ACEs, the first childhood experiences and trauma, restorative practices. How do we get those golden nuggets and say, what would it look like if the YMCA had this rich relational, they had this language? So, is that kind of what you're saying? Like, how do we? How do we grow this? Well, there's a, there's that. And your work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then your how work. do we how do we situate this situate this in the in the larger context of community? Mm -hmm. I think that's you know. And, and your work. And that's what. Yes. You, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. So thank right. you. But I, but I think and it's up to us. I know you've had your parents. Mm -hmm. Do you like this? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, Karina, say more. Oh. Oh, so, well, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. I just have noticed that you've been wanting to say something. Oh, yeah. sorry. Thank you. Yeah, about the question you were asking, uh, in this, the social program we have, uh, we have been asking children what they mean, what they think it means to get involved in peace building processes. And uh, we have been uh, identifying with them some potentials for peace building. One of them, um, they have uh, called it as effect, uh, affective potential, and for them that means <coughs> that they are able to love themselves, they're able to love others, which are close, like for example, their families, the people they, they know, 
like the, the teachers, their friends, the people from the community, which they're really close, and then they also think that uh, that potential means as well to be able to love others who are not as closer that maybe you don't even know, and then you do things for them. For example, uh, for others, uh, others, for other children, for other people, and that uh, get involved in uh, environmental um, caring. So you care for yourself, you care for the others who are next to you, you care for others who are not close and that you don't even know, like for the, the generations which will come next. And then you also care for the animals, for the plants, for the environment. And they have been talking about that, like spreading the care of the other. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, just to comment on that, at NOVA, um, Shelley Green, at, at NOVA University, Shelley Green is doing a, um, it's called equine therapy. So a lot of the equine therapy, so they're doing a lot of work with children who have um, you know, sort of trauma, the history of trauma, and with horses and animals, and they find that it's very helpful. So I think when you talk about the environment and using the environment as a, a source for animals, um, this has been very effective. One of the things we're doing um, in terms of practices um, we were working with, um, and we're also very interested in kind of self-care for NGO workers that are exposed to either vicarious or secondary trauma, and we were working with this group um, called Farm Africa in Nairobi, and um, in Kenya and South Sudan, and everyone in the, in the group had a neighbor or a close relative that had either died in the last um, post-election violence there, or was you know maimed in some way and so no one escaped the whole community was affected by this and um, we were doing a research project where we gave them the VIA assessment to look at their strengths it's, it's translated into Swahili and it's a wonderful strength based assessment if you don't know it it's free it's online um, you could get there through, <coughs> through our, <coughs> excuse me through our website but what we also did was an appreciative inquiry in that community about what sustains hope. And talking to people that have gone through that about how they use their transcendent strengths of hope and humor and gratitude and spirituality to sustain hope and have post-traumatic growth. And that, that whole field of post-traumatic growth and Jonathan Heath's work I think is wonderful. And, tipping the conversation so you're talking about strengths and you're not totalizing someone with a trauma, you know, as, as their identity. So that's that's what we've been doing, trying to get that dialogue of strengths going in, the, in those communities. Is, for some of you who haven't said much, I just want to, you know, make sure that if you want to add anything, just to open up the space a little bit. Just to uh, piggyback on that comment that Claire made, um, I think that's a valuable comment you made because I spent uh, three months in Haiti, post earthquake, working with earthquake victims. And um, in a country that was the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, um, and that was totally devastated by an earthquake where 238,000 people were killed in 31 seconds. Um, the thing that captured me the most when I was there for three months working with the victims was the fact that they had that sense of hope. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're looking all around you and you see total devastation and you see, you know, 50 to 60 victims a day where you think, oh my gosh, how are these people ever, ever going to get out of this? And yet, when I sat um, at night with my team and we debriefed about the day, and off in the distance we could hear possibly a hundred voices singing in that sense of hope. And I think it was because they had such a strong belief in their creator or their maker, however they chose to define that. Um, it was that sense of hope. But also the historical context. This was a people that, you know, at one time was a slave colony. And they survived, and they had that historical context. 
and you know I see that a lot in the work that I do up in the Arctic as well, where I have a lot of you know transgenerational trauma, where it's generation upon generation upon generation, communities that are rife with you know sexual abuse and, and domestic violence, and very often um, what what I think is helpful when working with people in that situation is really uh, understanding that we have to have a cultural sensitivity for what works for them in their own society as well. It's not for us to come in and impose our ways and say, we're the dominant, we do it this way, you have to follow. That will, that's the recipe for failure. So what we do is we very often go in and we say, okay, how can we dialogue, how can we come together in a collaborative understanding, you know, that a child needs to be kept safe, but how do you do it in your culture? And sometimes, you know, that's allowing a family to go through a shaming procedure with a perpetrator and allowing them to have that shaming ceremony or it may be accessing a native elder to do some therapy with the family you know and allowing the victim and the perpetrator to both express their pain so it's very often you know that we need to be mindful of that we cannot go in you know assuming that we are the expert and that our way is the only way and that's where I find social constructionism comes very much into it. It's, it's a club that fits because it really allows for the dialogue, communication, and collaboration. Thank you for bringing that up because that's very similar to what I, how I approach my work in South Africa and also working with refugee immigrants yeah. and other groups. And it's really about inviting them to rediscover and reclaim their own knowledge and wisdom on whatever it is, whether it's about working, realizing that they have tremendous resources within themselves and their collective community to bring forward to address if it's the post-conflict, you know, the, the internalized um, colonization in, and in, the, in South Africa about apartheid and what they have done already to, to be alive. To, to live with hope and uh, and to 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 realize their tremendous strengths, but it comes from them. It's just the questions that invite them into rediscovering, and it is so. Thank you for bringing that up and re-situating that, and to helping them realize that the question of how do people know what they know? You know, it's it's. I'm just there as to question, so they can rediscover. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for that, and and also for the South African work. I I've done a lot of thinking about you know why is it that the United States that supposedly thinks of itself as such a human rights advocate has has absolutely the the most extensive prison system in the world, the longest sentences, the harshest punishments. Um, and I wonder about, I'm really interested in, in looking at how the South African society has responded to apartheid and to the acknowledgement of apartheid and to the the development of truth and reconciliation commissions and you know we can talk about whether or not they've succeeded and how it succeeded but the the process of, the, of publicly acknowledging community trauma um, which I I just feel instinctively is so much so important um, just looking at the the, the notion of, of um, People dealing with the histories of sexual abuse in the, you know, and how the process of talking about it and and acknowledging it as a public problem, I think, has really um, led to a great deal of healing and allowed for that healing. And I think, in terms of South Africa, the acknowledgement of the damage of apartheid, you know, in some ways, in some fashion, um, is better than not acknowledging. This country has never acknowledged any form of, of trauma, traumatization of communities, genocide or slavery or internment. Well, internment to a small well, yeah, extent, a little. a little tiny bit, you know. But I mean, you know, what would be the effect of truly acknowledging those um, community traumas on a society? 
So I just wanted, I wanted to throw something out to the group. What I'm um, really inspired by, I just think this is an incredibly rich discussion. I am learning it, but yeah, I'm really appreciating it so much. And we have 10 minutes yes. so so left to go. Oh, yeah, yes. and I think I could like sit here with it's you all the day. day. Yes. <laughs> yes. I could, wish we could. And I'm wondering if we want to talk about as a group, you know, maybe a, a couple more minutes for some more stories and things that people were struck by, but um, talk about as a group about how we might want to continue the conversation or stay connected, learn together. I mean, all of these, we might be able to invite some people to, you know, David Denborough to maybe talk with us about certain things we can invite people in that we can learn from and learn from each other. What are, what are your thoughts? Is anyone else inspired? Thank you for that, Kristen. Yeah. Yes, because I think, yeah. Anyway, what would people like to offer? I certainly would like to continue the dialogue. Uh, I am so appreciative of everybody here, um, your expertise, your experiences. I came as a learner. Um, and, you know, I think what is nice is that, you know, Ken Gergen used the term cross, I call it cross pollinization because I'm a World Cafe fan and I've been using World Cafe techniques with students and with groups that I've met with. And, and I tend to do a lot of World Cafes, and I think, you know, that cross-pollinization has such richness to it. And I'm wondering if we could continue uh, post-conference in some way to connect and continue our dialogues and our experiences, and, you know, if information comes up that we think would be valuable to our group and to others, if how we can put that into place. That would be, be awesome. That would be awesome, yeah. 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 I, I, just, I, my senses and I, my assumption is that everybody has, it's like, we could hear from each, each and every one of us about, you know, to dive more deep, to find out really more about what are the things that you are faced with and what are you doing and so what have you found working with police, you know, what, you know, how are you, you know, what have you tried or what have you considered trying or you hear some ideas you're thinking about, you want some feedback, I mean, I know, you know, based on some of the work that Kristen and I kind of do similarly, you know, around even domestic and domestically about working with communities that have intergenerational trauma, you know, here to, to your point, Ellen, you know, so, you know, I do a lot of narrative kinds of practices similar, you know, I've studied with David, David Denborough with taking some of those techniques, but it's like, how to expand that, you know, and how to... So, I mean, that I have so much curiosity to learn from every one of you and probably people online. So, is, is there a general, I, you know, what are, where are other people with that? And I think just, oh, sorry. Yeah. Just adding to what you were saying, I, I think it's also to, to, at least for me, it would be like to take me out of that place of loneliness. Yes. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I being a good instrument for that person? You know, because there's no guidelines. When you have a victim in front of you, when you go like, oh my God, you know, I, I have to use myself as an instrument in that moment, but am I really doing what they're asking of me? I, am I helping, you know? And, and, and sometimes you get very lonely, you know, when you're dealing with this. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I'm not sure how the others feel, but when I saw this topic, I was kind of, uh, I was hoping that this was going to be one of the afternoon sessions, the longer yeah, sessions, because nice. yeah. yeah. nice. I would definitely yes. attend that one. So uh, perhaps for future events like this, this kind of topic would be, be more work. extensive, yeah. 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 because there seems to be a lot of deep feelings around these yeah. kinds of issues. And I just wanted to say that the next hour, um, uh, we're doing, uh, I'm doing a session on restorative justice, which, you know, it, it isn't exactly the same conversation, but there's a lot of similarity and there's a, there's a lot of, um, you know, theoretical and practical connections. What are you doing? This next hour. It's, it's an add-on. Yeah. Has there been any comments on, online or anything? Or? Um, great sound and video. People are watching. Oh, okay. <laughs> I should actually probably go because there's a chat stream there. You should see if anyone's okay. chatting. Oh, there's multiple, multiple sites that are... I, I might be here for these two. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, Barb and I, and I'm, I'm sure a few others, would really like to know David. David is a Denver. He's with the oh. center... He's with the Dulwich Center in Adelaide, Australia. It came out of like Michael White's 
work and David Epstein's work on narrative therapy. And so it's called the Dulwich Center for Narrative Therapy and Community Work. And how would you spell his last name? D E N. Uh, B, D, uh, how do, I, I'm blanking out. Well, if you, if you Google D-E-N-D-E-R-O-R-O-D-E-R-O-R-O-D-E-R-O-R-O-D-E-R-O-D-E-R-O-D-E-R-O-D-E-R-O-D-E-R-O-D-E-R-O-D-E-R-O-D-